Hi everyone, welcome to podcast, podcast 7, how to pick the perfect farm yarn for your project, or really any yarn for your project. Here's what's happening on the farm. So right now it's the middle of August, it's been a nice week, oh my gosh, it's been in like in the lower 80s with a nice breeze going and it's just been delightful to be outside and it makes me feel like um, fall is almost around the corner so that is my favorite season i love it when the weather breaks and we start getting you know crisp nights and um so that's pretty exciting um so this week poncha had his eight week um checkup for his PTLO surgery and his bone healed perfectly according to the vet. So we are now um, going to be doing bigger things for him, longer walks. Um, he's been doing these kind of like walk, run, walk, run kind of things with me. Um, so we'll continue working with that until um, he can hopefully go back on his job. Um, you will probably hear checkers in here with me. Um, we have um, a vet visit scheduled. Um, every once in a while, we just have the vet come to the farm for our regular animals. There's nothing wrong with anyone. It's just the yearly check, and um, Alfredo, Poncha's brother, is really car sick. And so we just can't take him in the car without really drugging him or else it becomes an olfactory problem. Um, so the farm vet is going to be coming as soon as she's done with surgery and um, seeing Chester and Gus, Alfredo and Checkers. So um, Poncha I just got seen yesterday and he's perfectly up to date on everything. And um, Bianca had a little had. I don't know, she got into some mix-up a couple weeks ago with something that bit her foot. So she's had all of her um, shots and everything updated as well And that farm visit. Sometimes we feel like we're spending our 401ks on um, animals. But, you know, we love them. They're part of the family, right? I'm also working on my no Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck sweater, and that is going swimmingly. Um, you can always catch up with that progress on my Thursday Thrums, which is at 1 o'clock on my Facebook Live. Um, you can subscribe to that as well, and I'm trying to then put those into the YouTube channel so that you can see those. Um, but I'm using the Thursday Live shows to... Um, for my accountability so that um, I don't just put this thing aside and stop doing it, <laughs> which I might be want to do. So, um, but this way I have a plan and I have people that are tuning in every week to watch to see if I'm doing it. So I feel like I have to hold up my end of the bargain. So let's get talking about stitches and farm yarns. So anytime that you start a new project, you just have to, there's like a myriad of questions that you need to be asking yourself um, when you start getting the inkling of the idea, you know, who is the project for? Are you making something for yourself or a friend or, or um, a family member? Is this person an adult or a kid or a teenager? Um, so, you know, who is it for? How much time do you really want to put into it if it's not for yourself or even if it is for yourself? Do you want something that's um, like a quickie project to keep your hands occupied while you binge watch on Ozark or um, Schitt's Creek? Or do you want to have something that's a little bit more um, intricate that you have to pay attention to and just because you feel like you want to challenge in these challenging times? Um, so also... What, so whoever that person is, it's, if it's yourself or someone else, it's like, what are the optimal colors for that person? Is that person somebody who um, looks good in yellows and golds and oranges? Or is that somebody that is not going to wear it unless it's blue? Or like the colors of their university? Um, what are going to be the optimal colors for that person? And then... Is this a hard wearing person or a delicate person? Like, is this item that you make, is it going to get like thrown into the back seat of the car or the trunk? Is it going to um, 
be or is it going to be treated like really gently and folded with tissue when it's not being worn um that also determines not only how much time you want to put in and effort but also probably the amount of money that you want to put into it too is it somebody that is going to hand wash it or is it going to be somebody that really needs to have something that they can just throw in the in the washing machine um, all of those are critical questions and then what kind of um what kind of garment are you talking about are you talking about a sweater a hat some fingerless mitts a scarf a cowl um, a little doll what kind of what kind of things what kind of garment or item are you talking about and then how much time do you want to spend how much money do you want to spend um, you know right now I think um, when I looked on Monday like we have a hundred and forty something days until Christmas that's still a lot of time to be able to make something for somebody for Christmas you could probably do a couple of things or you know a couple of gifts for different people but now is the time to be thinking how much time do you want to spend how much money do you want to spend and how's it going to be worn is it on the head on the neck on the torso on the feet or is it you know a, a doll or a table runner or something that isn't worn at all and if it is worn is it on a sensitive area um, it, things that are around a neck like cowls and scarves and to a certain extent shawls the neck is a very sensitive area and so that's some place where you want to make sure that that is soft enough that the person's going to enjoy wearing it and not think that they, that they're um, they oh my god I can't wait to get this off because it's so itchy um, and so will it be itchy to wear or will it be a cherished gift and then what season is it going to be worn in? Is, is it something that it definitely that has a definite season if it's something that is a Christmas present do you want to make it in Christmas colors is it a Hanukkah present and you want to make that for um, in, in Hanukkah colors um, do you does it have a wintry pattern in it like a snowflake pattern like some of the those great yoked sweaters that are kind of Scandinavian looking um, does it have leaves that might look good in spring or in fall or is it something that can be worn all year um, you know throughout the year um, also do you have preferred needles that you like to use as people are aging I hear a lot of people saying I don't want to do size one or two needles it's too small um, so and then I've heard other people it's like I don't want to do anything above a six like I really like small needles they fit my hands I enjoy using that size yarn so do you have a preferred set of needles that you like or a preferred size range of needles um, so um, and do you have hand issues there's a lot of um, needles out there that are um, just that are kind of catering to people with hand issues there's um, needles I don't know the name of them I will but I will put them in the, on the resources on my website page for podcasts but they are square needles and people that have like carpal tunnel or some other um, arthritis are saying that those are really easy to hold um, so if you do have some hand issues you might want to try some of these other um, needles and see if they uh, if they work better for you um, and then what is the scale of the knit is it a large scale pattern then you can use larger yarn or is it a small delicate pattern that you need to use like a fingering or a lace weight um, do you want it to be airy and drapey or do you want it to be snugly and warm all of those questions and then I'm sure it's like it seems like this is a huge amount of questions Lisa who is who's gonna do this um, but I think all those things kind of run through your mind um, as you're flipping through patterns if you have a pattern book that you keep or if you're looking through your library on Ravelry you kind of think about all of these things as you're going through some of the like what are your preferred needles to use 
that's something that you probably just know that if you're going to, like, I don't want to make, I don't want to make a fingering weight sweater. I'm sorry, I just don't. And I think that's because I am a highly distracted, really incredibly slow knitter. Like, I don't want to have a sweater that has like three billion stitches in it. You know, I want to make something that um, is still beautiful, but is not, um, it's not that many stitches and that much time and effort involved. Even though those sweaters are gorgeous and I keep looking at them and then I say, dang, they want a fingering weight. And yes, could I, could I substitute that? If you heard my podcast a couple um, episodes ago about substituting yarn, sure, I could probably do that. It's just harder when it is, is a fitted garment um, to... I, there, there would be a whole lot of math involved to take a fingering weight cardigan and change it to a worsted weight car cardigan. And I think in those instances, hey, just try to find a worsted weight um, cardigan. That's what I did with my no Rhinebeck sweater is um, I knew that I wanted um, a yoke. I knew that I want, uh, you know, like color work yoke. I knew that I wanted to have a steak in it because I didn't want to do... Um, any if I could if I could get away with it I didn't want to do any purling um, and because I because steaking is a new um, uh, skill for me I wanted to have more practice with it and um, I'm not scared of it because I had a very very good class in it by Ann Weaver she's a local Baltimore designer and um, and indie dyer and um, teacher extraordinaire. Um, so if you are thinking about wanting to do steaking, you should look her up. I will also put her into my, on the resource page. So those all of these questions that I was thinking about that I would just went through, I thought about with this sweater. I knew that like for the colors, um, since I, this is a hand spun and I did it from my own lamb fleeces and it, I spun it all white and then it took me, I'm telling you, it took me a year um, because I was kind of distracted, um, but to figure out, to, to take the leap and say, oh, I want to make this, this color. Um, it took me a long time to make, to make the plunge of what, what my background color would be and then what my color work color would be. So those kind of things that, that I talked about at the beginning about the color and the hard wearing and soft wearing and how I wanted to use a bigger yarn and I wanted to use bigger needles and not have so many millions of stitches. All of those things were involved, were rolling around in my mind as I was flipping through the Ravelry um, pictures until I found one that was with worsted weight. And that had a pattern that I thought I could accomplish because I haven't done a lot of color work. Um, this is my first color work sweater. And I think I've only just kind of messed around with doing samples of color work. So I haven't even done a scarf or mittens or anything yet in color work. So um, I wanted to have something that was simple enough and gorgeous um, that I would be happy with. So when we're talking about stitches and the kinds of things that we should, that you should think about um, when you're picking yarn to go with certain garments or, or um, different garments or different kinds of yarn that you have. So the easiest kinds of patterns, stitch patterns are going to be things that are knits and purls. Um, even though they are just knits and purls, they can be really interesting. Like they can be like an interwoven basket weave. Um, there's some that are um, like diagonals, diagonal ribbing that are really gorgeous. And you can even do some striping in a pattern. And it's all the way that you stitch and the way that you move the, the, um, the knits and purls around. And I'm, like I'm getting a little ker kerflunkled here because... Uh, Chester's barking downstairs and of course that means everybody's going to start barking in a minute. But anyway, knits and pearls. Back to knits and pearls. For when it's just knits and pearls, 
the more complicated the pattern is, the more solid that your yarn should be. Because when you have a lot of movement in your color, you lose the movement or the texture or the design in your stitch pattern. So if you're doing something that is a basket weave, you probably don't want to have something that's wildly variegated. Pick something that is semi-solid or something that has like a, that's like a semi-solid with freckles in it or something like that. Um, because you, if you're going to spend all that time counting stitches and changing from knitting to purling, you want that to be seen. So you know, pick the correct kind of dye technique for the pattern that you have. As far as textures of your yarn, you can do a myriad of textures here, but again, the more complicated the pattern is, the more soothing you want the yarn to be, the more smooth you want it to be. You Again, just to use that, like the basket weave kind of look, you don't, if you, if you use a boucle or something that has loops in it, or let's say something like one of those novelties that has eyelash in it, um, you're going to not see all the time that you spent to do to do the counting to make the um, the herringbone pattern or the woven basket weave kind of pattern. It's just going to get lost in there. So matching, that's what's really important about matching your stitches and the pattern with the kind of yarn that you're buying. So here you can't see these, but if you do go to my YouTube channel and you can watch the whole presentation that I kind of work from, it's my, my outline. And so I have some design ideas here for um, patterns that are just knits and pearls that are beautiful because of the choices of the yarn. The first one is the Rhinebeck hat by Wormwood. Um, it is gorgeous. It's, it uses two skeins of yarn and one of them is a variegated and one of them is a semi-solid. It is made up of short rows so that it looks like an undulating kind of snake and, um, and it's just gorgeous. So the body of the undulation is the variegated yarn and then it's outlined with the semi-solid. And again, that one is just all knits. The second one that I have here is called the Felix Pullover, and that one is done, it's a very, very simple pattern. It's all um, stockinette, I believe. It's either all stockinette or it's all garter. Um, but this one, it's beautiful because they used um, our Synergy yarn, and which is a marled kind of hand spun looking yarn. And that yarn has some self striping capabilities in there and she used our the majesty colorway which is a purple and so you have these beautiful subtle um, moving lines of the different purples throughout this pullover and it's just it's just gorgeous it's a, a simple simple pattern it has ribbing at the neck it looks like it's a boat neck um, it's got ribbing at the bottom and it's got ribbing on the cuffs um, it has an interesting looking um, way to attach the sleeves, um, but it's just, the, it sets off your yarn and it's, and it was such a simple pattern. And the last one that's on this page is my No Rhinebeck sweater, which is called Ayun, I-O-U-N-N. -N. It's a knitty pattern. Um, and again, it's just um, basically stockinette with color work in it. Well, how about cables? So cables, basically what you're doing with cables is you're t twisting stitches and you're changing the order of the stitches in the knitted fabric. So you're coming up to a place, you're gonna take two, two to four stitches out of the sequence. You're gonna put them in the front or the back and then you're gonna knit the, the ones, you're gonna kind of skip those. You're gonna knit the next ones that are on the needle and then you're going to go back and knit those ones that you had in the front or the back. Um, and basically the, these cables, they're typically, the cable part is knit in stockinette and the background is usually reverse stockinette. So the, so 
whenever you are knitting the cable that's standing out, you're knitting. And whenever you're doing the background, you're purling. These are really easy to knit. Again, it's just knitting and purling. Sometimes you have bobbles in there, depending on how complicated the pattern is. Um, but they look really complicated and they're just gorgeous because there's all these intertwining and um, viney kind of looks. It's really neat. Now you do need to be able to read a chart um, with um, cables. It's just the easiest way to keep track of where you are and what the cables should look like. You get a sense, you can see what is what is happening to the um, cables in that chart pattern, but you do need to know how to use that. Um, the first time that I did a, a cabled sweater, of course I chose a sweater, of course I did, and it was, um, it had a chart, and I kept getting it wrong, getting it wrong, getting, I just had to keep taking it out, and, and I just couldn't figure out what am I doing wrong. So I did have to go to a chart mentor, somebody that I knew read charts all the time. She teaches charts, um, and I just said, can you show me how to do this? Because I'm, like, I'm totally lost, and I'm tired of taking it out. So let that be a lesson. It's okay to ask for help. So uh, the cables, here's the, ticks, the tips and tricks. So with a cable, you should use a solid or semi-solid yarn. And you really, you want the texture of the stitches. You want those cables to stand out on the garment. So you also want a smooth yarn so that you can read the, the cables easily. Um, here, fiber content does make a difference. You want a yarn that has give and stretches. And you also want a yarn that has memory. And this is because you're stretching those stitches as you are take, are moving them from one side of, of other stitches and putting them, you know, in another place. Those stitches need to stretch, but then they need to also have memory so that, that when you go past that place um, and knit the next row, which is typically um, a, um, you know, just knit what you knit before kind of row, um, without the twisting so it kind of it levels it out and you those and then those cables kind of fit together as you um, as, as you go around so you want them to have a memory so that they will stick together so of course wool is a fiber that does that well um, this is something you do not want to use cotton with because cotton doesn't stretch it also doesn't have a memory um, and the thicker that the yarn is, the more defined your cables are going to be um, because they will stand out from the background um, better. So uh, again, I have some ideas of cable patterns here. Um, so I've shown there's um, a Harry Potter magazine that has a snake sweater in it, which is just a bunch of cables all over the whole thing. I knit this for Bill. I knit it twice because um, the first one that I knit, I followed their directions about making it all in pieces. Um, then I attached the sleeves and oh my God, they look like princess sleeves. You know, like Princess Diana's wedding dress has those really puffy sleeves. It looked like that, it was so embarrassing. So then what I did was that I um, made the sleeves, I set, I did, I picked up the sleeves essentially so that I, I wouldn't have to, you know, make them separate, you know, that that all would fit in, in line. And then that's beautiful. Um, but you can see that if you look on this, the YouTube channel, you can see that it, this is a worsted weight yarn and the cables really stand out. The middle one is a shawl called Verdant Pines, and that is a combination of cables and some lace. And this one is a DK, and it's kind of a shiny, it's, it's our Alto, which is um, B, Superwash BFL and Silk. Um, this one, the cables are a little bit more um, subtle in here. You can still see them quite well, but it's, it's more subtle than the thicker yarn would be. And the picture on the right 
is the Celtic cardigan. That's the one I was just talking to you about that I knit my first cable sweater. And that's also with a worsted. How about lace? So knitting lace basically is defined as artfully arranging holes to make a pattern. And the holes are typically made with yarn overs and yarn overs will increase your stitch count. So in order to balance out um, and to get back to being the same number of stitches, then you need to make decreases. And there's you know, a myriad number of different kinds of decreases that can be made things that are point that are leaning left and things that are leaning right and those are what makes the beautiful pattern some of them look like flowers or they look like leaves um, do you need lace yarn to make lace no you can make lace a lace pattern in any weight of look, yarn that you would like you can make a, a beautiful like wedding shawl out of you know lace weight yarn that is you know silk and gorgeous but you can even you can make a lace a lace patterned shawl or cardigan with worsted or even Aran weight you can probably do it with bulky but that might be pushing it um, you'd have to make sure that the bulky was quite well plied I think so some of the lace to I keep saying ticks instead of tips and tricks so again, you're spending all this time and doing all this counting with lace. So you need to use something that is semi-solid or at the very most has like some spreckles in it. Um, because you want to be able to read the pattern, the more wild the color changes are, the less that you're going to see of that lace pattern. And you just went to all that trouble to do it. I mean, even the simplest lace, which is like an eyelet, which is you know, knit two together, yarn over, knit two together, yarn over, and then you knit the whole, the next row or purl it, depending on if you're doing it in the round or whatever. Um, if you do that with a wild um, variegated yarn, you don't see any holes. All you see is the color. Um, for texture, um, a smooth yarn is going to show that hole better than a yarn with a halo like um, I kid mohair, really fluffy yarn, um, but that could be a design consideration if you really wanted to have to use one of those yarns. Um, you could do it with that. Just know that it will be a little bit harder to see your pattern through all that uh, fluff. And as far as far as fiber, you need again, you need a yarn that's going to stretch and that's going to hold its shape. Um, at the end of knitting this, you're going to block it and you're going to, so when you block it, you're going to open up all of those holes. So you need a yarn that's going to stretch while it's wet, but then it's going to hold its shape when it's dry. And so again, sometimes cotton can do that or a cotton blend. Um, wool or a wool blend is really good at this because again, it's great at stretching and it has a memory. It stays where you put it. A superwash of wool, though, it may not hold the shape as well as a natural wool. And that's because in a superwash wool, they've taken off all of the scales on the fibers. So they don't hold on to each other quite as easily. So just bear that one in mind. Another tip that I would say is if you've committed to make a yarn pattern, sorry, if you've committed to make a lace pattern, use stitch markers. Every repeat, put in a stitch marker. When it changes into a different lace, put in a lifeline. You will thank me later. So here are some design ideas for lace patterns. I cut a frog in my throat, excuse me. <coughs> so on the left, this is waiting for rain. And this is made with a worsted weight yarn on size 10 needles and it looks beautiful. It's not exactly what the designer intended. She wanted me to use fingering weight and size four needles, but we decided to use this to highlight our lively yarn. Our middle picture is land of silver birch. 
which is done with our Alto, which is the DK um, Superwash BFL and Silk. And here the lace is in the side seams and on the sleeve. And that even though it's a superwash, it still has held its shape with through the blocking process. You can see the holes, you can see the design. And the third one is called um, diamond diamond lace sh uh, scarf, I think. Um, and that one is that one is not on Ravelry. That's one that we have. And so it has a lace down the center. And it has cables there too. And that was knit with our Zephyrette, which does have a bit of a halo. It's also a thinner yarn. It's a light sport weight. You can see the lace quite well. It's a little bit hard to differentiate the cable though. And I think that that kind of shows you with a cable, it's nicer. It's kind of nice to have a thicker yarn because then it will stand out farther on you know, in your knitting and it's easier to discern. Brioche, oh my goodness. So brioche is, um, it's a family of knitting patterns that have what they call tuck stitches. So it's a yarn over and a stitch together that are knit as one. And um, it can be kind of confusing. Um, I'm not especially good at it. I did make this cowl that's there that I call um, Aspen. And um, the, the wonderful thing about this is that brioche tends to be like super squishy um, and it's nice with fatter yarns. You can use, you can use any weight of yarn with brioche. Um, and the straightforward brioche can be kind of mesmerizing looking and I love the two color brioche. So with this one that I'm showing, it, it has a variegated as one of the colors and it has a semi-solid as the other. So it really highlights um, the two yarns together and makes just a wonderful fabric. On that one, again, you, could use, you can use any fiber with this one. You can use cotton with this one. It's, it's squishy, it doesn't need to be blocked. Um, and so it, it doesn't really need to have a memory. So you can use any kind of fiber or any weight with a brioche. And then you have your drop, drop stitch patterns. These ones are just totally fun. And so these make kind of open vertical stripes or um, sometimes they can be like eye shaped um, in your garment. And basically you're doing a bunch of different yarn overs um, on your needle and they, uh, really make wonderful open fabrics. These are great to use um, variegated yarn. Something that you really want to show off the yarn is great in a drop stitch kind of a pattern because you have when what, after you drop this, all those yarn overs, then you have you know anywhere from a half an inch to maybe two inches of of a yarn bar. So you can really see what the variegation is doing and it just makes it really, um, really fun to use highly variegated yarns on drop stitch patterns. Um, this one, you don't, the, the only thing that you want to, to pay attention to here is that you don't really want to use slippery yarns with these kind of patterns because the, the, they don't hold their shape because there's not a lot of structure you know, maybe you have two, two or three rows of garter that are holding these drop stitches. And so um, if you have this kind of a slippery yarn, like a 100% alpaca or some maybe 100% silk, that it, your garment will end up growing. It will end up stretching and stretching. And so you want to maybe have something that's a, a blend of those fibers instead of having a hundred percent for those. So what are you going to make next? Now that I've, I've asked you all those questions and talked a little bit about um, different stitch patterns and what kinds of yarns you might use, are you going to make a sweater? I'd love to see if you're going to make a no Rhinebeck sweater. We still have two months two months to make it. Or you can make a shawl. Do you want to try lace or cables? Have you, what, 
what do you want to do to kind of um, increase your your repertoire of stitches and skills. So I'd love it if you um, leave me a note, send me an email, let me know what you're going to be making next and what kind of stitches that you're going to try. Coming soon to the podcast, I'm working on getting a conversation with Emily Shamlin, our shearer on record. Um, and I would love to do some more Q&A type of um, podcast. So if you have any questions about yarn or about farming or about crafting with wool and mohair or alpaca or, you know, angora bunny or any of those things, um, just shoot me an email or send me a message on Facebook. Um, I'd love to be able to answer your questions. And remember... You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, or you can go to our website and look at our podcast episode page. On that page, you will also find um, all the resources that I've mentioned with links to those resources. So until we meet again, happy making.